So now that Thanksgiving is over, uh, we've officially started the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about holidays and the holy day mm. is the title of the message for today. Holidays and the holy day. So let's take our Bibles out to the book, of, the book of Exodus. You know, God is a God that has many names. He has a lot of names. And we're going to look at one of his names in um, Exodus 34, verse 14. Please say amen when you found that. The Bible says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is what? Jealous. Jealous. Y'all jealous. Mm. know that one of God's names is jealous. jealous. And then it says, uh, and it is a jealous God. Why? Why is God jealous? What makes God jealous? Mm. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, for I am jealous over you with what type of jealousy? Godly. Godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Mm. So we need to understand today that there is something called godly jealousy, and then there is ungodly jealousy. Mm -hmm. Ungodly jealousy is when you are jealous of something or someone that is not yours. Mm. And you're plotting and scheming how you're going to get it, mm. how you're going to take it. For example, someone in the church has a position that you want, mm. and you're plotting and scheming of how you're going to make them look bad so you can get their position. Mm. Have mercy. mercy. But godly jealousy is when something that is yours is wrongfully taken from you, and you naturally want it back. Mm. Now, when we give our lives to Jesus, we become what? His. We become the bride of Christ. We are His. Mm -hmm. We are committed to Him. And what makes a married man jealous? Mm -hmm. How many of you husbands would want your, your wife to go off, to run off with another man? Uh -oh. Or even another woman nowadays? Happens a lot. You know, I read a news report of a wife who found out her husband was cheating on her, and she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. You think that husband thought of that that would be the, the outcome of his choice? We have to think about things before we do them. Amen? That's right. She was overwhelmed with sadness and grief because the one who committed to be with her for life violated the covenant. That is how Christ feels when we commit ourselves to him through baptism and we persistently violate the covenant mm -hmm. and go after the things of this world. God gets jealous when someone or something takes our attention away from him and we fall into idolatry. Mm. Idolatry makes God jealous. The Bible warns us of, of idolatry in the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, looking at verse 29, look what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in verse 29, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nation from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. After that they are destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. So here we see that God warns that idolatry is a snare, which is what? It's a trap. A trap is easy to fall into and difficult to come out. Now, what are some of the popular idols of our day? What are some of the popular? Here's some of the American idols. Of course, you see money right there. You got to see sports, technology, social media, celebrities. These are just some of the you got a. Uh, <coughs> Joel, stand on there, have mercy. <laughs> These are some of the popular idols of today. Material possessions, cars, motorcycles, electronics. Now, in America, sometimes we call our idol worship hobbies. 
Hobbies are often idle because outside of work, they get all of our attention and God gets none or almost none. Mm. Now, you know, me growing up, this was my idol right here. That was my idol. Mm. I would stay up all night playing video games. I would sleep over at my friend's house and we would stay up all night and have a splitting headache in the morning from playing so many video games. And if my parents decided to take it away, the rage mm. would come out. Uh -oh. You better give me back, my Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> but the devil is doing all that he can do to saturate our society with idolatry, just as he did with ancient Israel. Now the Bible tells us, in the book of Daniel, now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, that was their Hebrew names, unto whom the prince of the units gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, and Mishael, Meshach, and of Azariah, Abednego. He changed their names. Why did he do that? Because he was trying to re-educate them with idolatry. Mm. The name Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Baal protects his life. Mm. Hananiah is my God is gracious. Shadrach means command of, uh, command of the moon god. Mm. And Mishael is who is as God, or who as God is, Meshach, who is Aku. Mm. And Azariah, servant of God, and Abednego, servant of Nebo. Mm. Mm. So uh, the king of Babylon was trying to re-educate them, and he also gave them an unhealthy diet, trying to pollute them and corrupt them physically as well. <clears throat> but the three Hebrew boys resisted these idolatrous influences and were faithful to the God of heaven. They stayed faithful to the health message. And when the time came where the golden image was set up, they uh, were were not they, they they were connected to God and thus did not bow down and worship the golden image. But the majority of Israel worshipped the image because they were snared into idolatry. So the application of that story is that Satan has saturated our society with paganism. And in fact, you just look at the days of the week. The days of the week are all after pagan gods. Sunday goes, is, is for the sun god, and Monday for the moon god, and, and Tuesday for, 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 for Tyre, and Wednesday is for the Nordic god Woden, mm -hmm. who was, uh, was also known as Odin. Who was Woden and who was Odin? They were the, uh, he was the god of war. He was a Norse or Norwegian god. Uh, known as the god of war, who flew around on a flying horse. And in fact, this is the origin of Santa Claus. Mm. Did y'all you know that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Santa Claus comes from St. Nicholas, but St. Nicholas did not fly around on a flying horse or flying chariot. That came in from the, from the Norse god Woden or Odin. So really, it comes from paganism. But our society is saturated with pagan symbols. This is right in the middle of D.C., right near where I'm from. We know this is the Washington Monument, donated by the Freemasons. Uh, that is the, the uh, male sex symbol, known as an obelisk. And we have one of those downtown. Downtown Indianapolis and many cities have that. Pagan symbols, right on the most printed dollar, is the, uh, the um, all-seeing eye which a uh, pyramid is an occult symbol, 60 degrees on each side, 666, where our society is saturated with idolatry. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8. Ezekiel, chapter 8. Ezekiel, chapter 8, looking at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord of God fell upon me. Then I beheld a low likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of the loins, even downward fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by the lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven, and brought me in visions of God to, to, uh, to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, 
where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. So in Ezekiel, God takes Ezekiel by the lock of his hair and he shows Ezekiel all the secret abominations of his people. And the first thing he sees is, is his people worshiping this image of jealousy. But then in, in uh, verse 6 and verse 7, he shows them greater abominations. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the greater abomination that the house of Israel uh, uh, committed there, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of, of, of a court, and I, when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. So God then shows Ezekiel greater abominations through a little hole in the wall. And this is what God would often do with, with the prophets of Israel. He would show them the sins of his people, not to embarrass them, but to what? To save them. Not to expose them, but to save them. Thought question. If God showed Ezekiel through a little hole in the wall, the sins of West Side Ministries, what would, what would he have seen? What type of television shows would, would Ezekiel have seen? Mm. Us watching West, uh, 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 in our private homes. Would he have seen us watching all the demonic horror flicks during the Halloween month? Flat, uh, two months ago. Would he uh, see us watching the, uh, the, the magical Santa Claus movies that fills our minds with mists and tales mm. in the privacy of our homes? What type of music would Ezekiel have seen God's people listening to? Hopefully not, uh, what's this guy's name? Travis Scott. Y'all heard about it. Mm -hmm. Ten people died at his so-called concert, which really might have been a satanic ritual. Mm -hmm. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Ten people died after being walked over and stampeded upon this is from Newsweek. A priest and exorcist has likened Travis Scott's astral world to the gates of hell and has labeled a festival satanic. Father Michael Ma uh, Maganot appeared on Fox News on Monday night where he spoke to, Jess to Jesse Walters about the fatal crowd surge at the concert and blamed satanic influences. Mm. And then it says, attendees have widely described their experience as hellish, and immediately after the concert, conspiracies at the festival was a blood sacrifice being spread on social media. Much of the rapper's promotional material for the festival is centered on demonic imagery and symbolism. Mm -hmm. Are we are we listening to the devil's music in our homes? Mm -hmm. Hope not. What of our what type of music are our children listening to? And this is the this is the astral world uh, entrance. You actually have to walk uh, into that. Uh, his, into his mouth in order to get into the Astro World um, concert. So it, it's, uh, it, it's just demonic. And then we have uh, Lil, Nas, Lil Nas X, who was selling these shoes for $1,000. What's on the back of the suit? Shoes. 666. Six, six, six. Those shoes sold out in about a minute. Luke 10 18 says, I'll be selling Satan as light and fall from heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, I was at a Bible study on Thursday, and I was talking to the guy about this, and, and he was, actually, he was telling me about this, and he was telling me how, uh, yeah, he was watching one of the videos, and he, he knows how, you know, a lot of rap videos and stuff, they have women, you know, scantily dressed, dancing behind the scenes. Well, he said, man, I just can't believe this. I was watching this video, and they had men, not just dancing in the background, but nude men mm. in the background, and I didn't believe them. So I went on Google, and, and sure enough, you go on Google, you see it all. Nude men dancing. Well, uh, in one of his videos, totally nude, and he's kissing up on him too. Mm. This is the this is where our society has has gone to. I mean, it's become a sodom. So we have to be careful the type of music that we're listening to, and we have to guard the music that our children are listening to. What would Ezekiel have seen us watching on our phones when we think no one's looking? Mm. Have mercy. Mm. What would Ezekiel have seen us? Uh, eating in secret. Will we be following, would he see us following the health message? Or would he see us secretly eating abominable things, even during a 
pandemic, lowering our immune system. What type of communication would Ezekiel have seen us having with our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we showing love and patience toward one another? What about our spouses and children? Are we patient with one another? Or are we a short few stick of dynamite claiming to be Christian? Mm. You know, in some Adventist homes, we, we're yelling at each other, yelling at our, at our children and our spouses, and, and then all of a sudden one of our church friends calls and we're like, hey, how you doing? Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh-oh. The Bible says, out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Listen to this right here. It says, above all things, parents should surround their children with an atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. A home where love dwells and where it finds expression in looks, in words, and acts is a place where angels delight to dwell. My question to you is, do angels like to dwell in your home? Or angels trying to get out of your home because it's so much drama going on. Now, I know it's cold outside. Some people might have winter blues. Mm. But God's people should always have joy. Amen? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But if we want angels to dwell in our homes, we have to learn to control our tempers and speak kindly and patiently toward one another. Amen? Mm -hmm. We got to be praying and battling with self. To overcome our shortness of temper. The Bible says in Ezekiel 8, 14, Then he brought me to, uh, to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for who? Tammuz. For Tammuz. Who was Tammuz? Take our Bibles out to Genesis chapter 10. Looking at Genesis chapter 10. Looking at verse 8. Genesis chapter 10. Looking at verse 8, the Bible says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So, uh, one of Noah's sons, Ham, had a son named what? Cush. And Cush had a son named Nimrod. And Nimrod was a mighty hunter, the first king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. who, he was the one, of course, who, who built a tower of Babel in rebellion against God. Well, Nimrod, his, uh, when, when his father Cush died, he married his own mother, Semiramis, mm -hmm. and gave birth to Tammuz. And after Nimrod died, Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, and Tammuz was believed to be Nimrod reincarnated and also thus the sun god as well. But Tammuz later died of an accident, of a hunting accident by a wild boar, and his blood spilt upon an evergreen tree, making it sacred to the pagan occult world throughout history. And the weeping for Tammuz is a 40-day fast. The weeping for Tammuz talked about in Ezekiel chapter 8 is a 40-day fast that is now practiced by the Roman Catholic Church in the form of Lent under the name of Lent. The 40-day fast has nothing to do with Christ fasting in the wilderness. It has to do with Lent. And, and which comes, of course, after Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But weeping for Tammuz is really, that, that, that's a pagan practice. And uh, Tammuz, his birthday so happens to be, guess when? December 25th. Mm. Similar to Christ, Tammuz being the son of the sun god, Nimrod, Christ being the son of God. But also, the Persian god and Roman god Mithra, his birthday was also December 25th. So this is the origin of the Christmas tree and the Christmas season. But the Romans continued to celebrate this winter festival under the name Saturnalia, which is a pagan time, a, a, a pagan time of feasting, drunkenness and nudity. Evergreen trees and, and Christmas wreaths, as you can see in, in the uh, picture there, were prominent during the Saturnalia, the Saturnalia um, festivities. Kissing beneath the mistletoe originates. Is that, does, he find it, it, does that come from the Bible? Does that come from the birth of Christ? 
that originates from Greece and is connected with fertility. But you see, Satan has saturated our society with the pagan customs of Christmas, Halloween, and Easter, just as, is, as he did with Israel and snared them into idolatry. But look what the Bible tells us about it in Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. The Bible says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, in the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord. Learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, and, and the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails, with, uh, and, and with hammers that it move not. So what does the Bible say about God's people? It says, learn not the ways of the heathen. Follow not the custom of fixing a tree in your home and decking it with silver and with gold. The Christmas tree does not point to Jesus, but it points to Tammuz and to sun and nature worship. Now it so happens, this happens every, what, seven years or so, or, or sometimes more, that the, the, uh, that the Christmas tree uh, Christmas Day falls on the Sabbath. This year, Christmas falls on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Look at your count. The 25th is on the Sabbath. Did y'all know that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of the people are like, oh man. <laughs> this is going to be a horrible Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, which is more important to you? The Sabbath or Christmas? Mm. Hmm. The day that God made holy or the day that the, pagan, that, that the pagans made sacred to idol worshipers? So what are we going to be doing on Christmas Eve this year? Are we going to be watching uh, uh, the, the uh, Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens? <laughs> Where uh, Scrooge is, is talking to the dead? <laughs> Ghosts of Christmas, past, present, and future. Are we going to be watching Charlie Brown's Christmas mm. with our children on Christmas Eve? <laughs> or are we going to be worshiping in the Sabbath? Mm. Which one? Mm. Now, though Christmas is a really a, a pagan holiday, we don't have to be a Scrooge on that day. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 21, it says, Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. History proves that society really cannot entirely ignore Christmas. In fact, during the Protestant Reformation, the Catholics strongly promoted Christmas, but the Protestants were strongly against it at first. In fact, the Protestant Puritans outlawed Christmas in the year 1659. Public notice. The observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege and the exchange of gifts and greetings, dre dressing in fine clothing and something and similar satanic practices are hereby forbidden with an offender liable of fine of five shares. That's like mm. 50 bucks. Mm. You get caught celebrating Christmas. Now, why did they have that law? Well, back then, you know, Christmas was more like M Mardi Gras. You know, Christmas has changed actually through, through the years. Um, but like over back in the 1700s and you know during you know the 1600s, it was like Mardi Gras, where uh, they, uh, they there was there was actually orgies mm. among spouses. They would trade spouses and 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 drunkenness. There was pranks on the rich who didn't give to the poor. Mm. Listen to this. It says for Romans, one week at the end of December was reserved for merrymaking from. Uh, the 17th to 23rd of December, every year, the festival of Saturnalia celebrated the god Saturn. There are many similarities between Saturnalia and Christmas, including using bowls of holly as decoration, giving gifts and feasting. At the end of the year, Rome was the place to party. Social norms went out of the window as the city took on carnivalesque carnival atmosphere. Uh, excessive drinking, feasting, cross-dressing, and orgies were commonplace. The Roman poet Marshall, uh, Marshall published during the Saturnalia 
as he felt that the liberal spirit caused by the festival made the licentious nature of many of the epigrams permissible. For one week, slaves were pointly, uh, wore pointy hats to signify them as recently made freemen, and they could partake in the same uh, celestious uh, behavior as their masters. Mm -hmm. A little history there on Christmas and Saturnalia. So at first, the Protestants were against Christmas. But as time went by, as time progressed, they uh, started to notice that their members, even though they weren't celebrating Christmas, were still celebrating the other, the Catholic uh, celebrations and, and the secular celebrations. So eventually, he just gave in and like, you might as well just celebrate. But even Ellen White says that we should not ignore the December 25th or the, the 25th of, of December. She says, as the 25th of December is observed to commemorate the birth of Christ, as the children have been instructed by priests of an example, that this was indeed a day of gladness and rejoicing, you will find it difficult, a difficult matter to pass over this period without giving it some attention. It can be made to serve a very good purpose. The youth should be treated very carefully. They should not be left on Christmas to find their own amusement in vanity and pleasure seeking in amusements which will be detrimental to their spirituality. Parents can control this matter by turning the minds and the offerings of their children uh, to God and his cause and the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. So remember the verse, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's, that's what she's talking about. Right? We don't have to be overcome by the paganism of Christmas. Use it for good. The holiday season is fast approaching, and its interchange of gifts, and, and old and young are intently studying what they can bestow upon their friends as a token of affectionate remembrance. It is pleasant to receive a gift. However small from those we love, it is an assurance that we are not forgotten, and seems to bind, us, bind them a little closer together. We should make our gifts such as will prove a real benefit to the receiver. I would recommend such books as will be an aid to uh, in understanding the Word of God, or that will increase our love for its precepts, provide something to be read during these long winter evenings. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say it's wrong to give gifts, but what type of gifts are we gonna, are we gonna give? Children, would, would you be okay receiving a book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. Uh -oh. <laughs> so seeing that people are celebrating the birth of Jesus, we can use this opportunity to go out there and to sing the first Advent hymns. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, right. that's, our, that's our West Side tradition, by the way. I don't know if y'all know that, but for the last seven, eight years, actually longer than that, it's been a long time, by t over 10 years, every, every uh, Christmas season we go out and we do Christmas caroling, yes. singing the first Advent hymns, and just uh, last three or four years, we've been going doing it downtown at the Circle, right next to the Obelix. Mm -hmm. Singing right. about Jesus. That's Amen? Right. That's right. Amen. So, mark on your calendars December 18th at 5 o'clock. We're going to be doing Christmas caroling. And I was telling me to bring her guitar, her little electric guitar, and, uh, and homeless outreach. We're going to wrap some uh, blankets and I don't know if we're going to wrap them, but uh, we're going to wrap up great controversies. And we're going to do a homeless outreach. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about bringing some tents and bringing some gloves, some hats. And then after that, we eat together for dinner. Amen? Amen. And guess what? The church is going to take care of it. That's right. So I hope all of us will, will try to make that. Amen? Amen. That's December 18th. Next time, we're going to go out to Westlake. Now, we need to understand today that God's people don't have to have a tree to be married. Mm. Amen. We don't have to dress up with a white beard and a red suit to be joyful. That's right. We don't need spiked eggnog mm. to have a good laugh. That's right. Which, by the way, that's the origin of eggnog. Eggnog was all alcoholic back in the days. Yes. In fact, look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to show you how merry and happy and joyful God's people were on the day of Pentecost. Go to Acts chapter 2. We don't have to be Scrooges, amen? Sure don't. People should come to church and see the most happy people, joyful people they've ever met. That's right. It says in Acts chapter 2, 
Verse 44, and all that believed were, were, were together and had all things in common and sold the possessions and goods and parted them to all men. They were giving gifts to one another. And they continued daily with one, another, with, with one accord in, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. And they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And it says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we see after the death of Pentecost, God's people were merry. They were joyful. They gave gifts one to another. They ate together and they worked together like family. That's right. That's right. That's what we want to see in God's church. Amen. They had no Christmas tree, no mistletoe, no spiked eggnog, no Santa movies, and yet they had greater joy than anyone out there. Sure did. The question is, is are are God's people, are we at Westside experiencing this joy that the apostles had spoken of in the book of Acts chapter 2? If not, we need to experience it. That's right. Because that's a sign that God's Holy Spirit is here. Amen? Amen. God's people, we need to fellowship together. We need to eat together. That's right. We need to study the word together and work the mission field together, even do recreational things together. You see, with a lot of Adventist churches, we come to church on the Sabbath, we say, Happy Sabbath, and when the, when the worship is over, we say, Okay, I'll see you next Sabbath. Mm. I'll talk to you next Sabbath. <laughs> is that the way God's church is supposed to be? Mm -mm. No. no. We're supposed to be a family. And we're supposed to have true brotherly love for one another. Amen. Ezekiel 8, 16. Look what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 8. Look at it, verse 16. The Bible says, He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Here we see that God's people began to worship the sun. The ancient Romans, they following the Egyptians, called Sunday the day of the sun, the end of the soul, which is where we get Sunday. And this is what happened in the 4th century. Constantine came into the church and as, as a political move to bring the sun worshipers into the church, he changed or, or he began to celebrate the venerable day of the sun and, and then eventually changed uh, the, the day of the Sabbath and brought in the first Sunday law in 321 A.D. This change was predicted in the Bible. In Daniel 7.25, we should know this verse. It says, he shall, think, he shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and laws, which is referring to the day of the Sabbath. They changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. It says the Catholic Church, by, the, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from, the, uh, uh, from Saturday to Sunday. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change sat, uh, Saturday, to sun, uh, Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of, of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. So her mark of authority, the Pope's authority, is that they can change the day of the Sabbath. Mm. When the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 20, 20, and hallow my Sabbath, that they shall be a sign between me and you, that you might know that I'm the Lord thy God. The sign that we worship God and serve the true God is that we keep the seven-day Sabbath. Now, among Adventists, even though we know that the Sabbath is a sign that we worship the true God, there are very few who actually keep the Sabbath. Mm. Regularly, faithfully. And look what it says that the ministers are supposed to do. In establishing new churches, ministers should give, what does it say? Careful, Careful instructions. It's our job as elders. As, as Gerald and all the elders, we're supposed to teach the church how to keep the Sabbath. That's right. We're supposed to give proper uh, instruction as how to properly observe the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. we, must, uh, we must be guarded lest the lax uh, practices that prevail among Sunday keepers. Mercy. People go to church Sunday, what do they do? They go to church Sunday, and then after they come home from church, it's just life as usual. Is that the way it is for us at that minute? We just go to church Saturday, and then after the church service, uh -oh. it's life as usual? Uh-oh. Mercy. 
lot of us paying bills. Mm. Buying food in the grocery store when the sun went down. Mm. Buying gas, I might get to church, gotta go get gas. You should have done that before. That's what preparation day is for. That's right. And it's hard with, with the hour, with the hour, with the time change, it's hard to, to uh, get used to that early sunset. And we always are our excuse, you know what our excuse is, right? The ox fell in the ditch, <laughs> it's an emergency. <laughs> But it says that we have to guard lest the lax practices that prevail among Sunday keepers shall be followed by those who profess to observe God's rest day. Mm. The line of demarcation is to be made clear and distinct Same. between those who bear the mark of God's kingdom and those who bear the sign of the kingdom of rebellion. Far more sac uh, uh, sacredness is attached to the Sabbath than is given it by many professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment either in the letter or in the spirit he calls for what reform, reform. and observance of the sabbath so we're in the holiday season mm. so we need to start reforming how we keep the holiday and that holiday is not once a year it's every week amen, amen. look at this all through the week we are to have the sabbath in mind and making preparations to keep it according to them and wait a minute we thought it was friday we all of a sudden get ready a lot of us going to work on Friday. How are we supposed to, you know, sun sets by the time you get out, you all of a sudden prepare for the Sabbath, it's like 4 o'clock p.m. Mm. Sabbath comes in over an hour. All through the week, especially during the early sunset. And, and part of that preparation is your relationships with one another. Here the preparation for the Sabbath must begin. Through the week, let parents remember that their home is to be a school in which their children shall be prepared for the courts above. Let their words be right. No words which, uh, which their children should uh, no words which their children should not hear are to escape their lips. Let the spirit be kept free from irritation. Parents during the week live as in a sight of a holy God who has given you children to train for Him. Train for Him the little church in your home that on the Sabbath all may be prepared to to worship in the Lord's sanctuary. That's right. So if husbands yelling at wife, wife's yelling at husband, and, mm. and, and parents are yelling at children and screaming and cussing each other out, it's time to go to church. Mm. <laughs> I don't feel like going to church. <laughs> I'm staying home. This COVID, you know, it's pandemic, mm. making excuses. We have to learn to communicate with patience and humility with one another in the home, or it will ruin our Sabbath experience. How are we going to be yelling and screaming at each other and then we come to church and praising God? Mm -hmm. Lord help us. And you know, a lot of parents, we should flip-flop between being overly strict with our children to letting them, have, letting them do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And the children get confused. The result is confusion. Ellen White talks about that. Instead, she said, we need to be calm and firm on principle, but, not, but, but reasonable and not extreme. That's how we need to govern our home, by God's grace. Exodus chapter 16. We should know this verse right here. Most of us know it. Exodus 16. Look what the Bible says. Looking at verse 22. And it came to pass, and on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers, and one uh, for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, and he said unto them, this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you bake, which ye shall bake today, and see that which you will see, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept unto the morning. So what does it say? It says we should have twice as much food on Friday prepared for the Sabbath. Spirit of Prophecy says on Friday let the pr preparation for the Sabbath be completed. Remember, it started on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow we got to start preparing for the Sabbath. Amen. That's right. That's right. See that all the clothes, that clothing is in readiness, and that all the what? Cooking. Cooking is done. Let the boots be blacked and the baths be taken. Now I know some people have an issue with this. I know back then the baths were a little harder to do, but I think by God's grace we we, we, can, we can practice as much as possible. 
I mean, if you stink it and, and, and smell it because you know it's hot in your home, you don't have any AC, then by, by all means, take a bath. But, but we should try to practice this. It is possible to do this if you make it a rule you can do it. The Sabbath is not to be given to the repairing of garments, to the cooking of the food, to pleasure seeking, or to any other worldly employment. So my question to you, I have to answer this. When sunset came in yesterday, mm -hmm. at 5, was it 522 maybe? Yeah. Was all the cooking done in your home? Were, 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 were your, your shoes clean, your clothes ironed, and baths mm. taken? Mm. Now, for many of us as Adventists, we used to practice those principles back in the days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we used to. But over time, we've grown kind of laxed in our Sabbath keeping principles and begin to compromise because of all the liberalism and compromise that's going on in the Adventist church. So guess what? It's time for reform, amen? Amen. Time for reform. We also need to guard the edges of the Sabbath. It's not at 523 we start cutting off the secular TV shows and start singing and praising God. We should already be having worship. We should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. Remember that every moment is consecrated holy time. Whenever it is possible, employers should give their workers the hours from Friday noon until the beginning of the Sabbath. Give this quote to your employers. See what they say. <laughs> Have mercy. <laughs> Make sure you pray first. <laughs> but you know, when we're, when we're working a full day on Friday, it's really hard to keep the Sabbath correct. It's almost impossible. You have to do all your preparation on Friday, on Thursday night, especially during during the winter months. But God's people should be having worship to enter and to close the Sabbath. That family worship, let the children take part. Let all bring their Bibles and read, and each read a verse or two. Then let some familiar hymn be sung, followed by prayer. For this Christ has given a model, the Lord's Prayer was not intended to be repeated merely as a form, but it is an illustration of what our prayer should be. Simple, earnest, comprehensive, in a simple petition, tell the Lord your needs and express gratitude for his mercies. Thus you invite Jesus as a welcome guest into your home. Family worship. How many of us have family worship? Amen. 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 We need to have family worship really every night and in the morning if you can. Um, but especially to open and close the Sabbath. But the reason why many Adventist families are missing out on blessings is because our Sabbath keeping principles have grown so laxed. You hear that? Sabbath keeping principles, we've grown laxed. Listen to this. If we desire the blessing promised to the obedient, we must observe the Sabbath for what? Strictly. Strictly. A lot of us, we used to observe the Sabbath strictly, but we've grown lax. I fear that we often travel on this day when it might be avoided. In harmony with the light which the Lord has given in regard to the observance of the Sabbath, we should be more careful about traveling on the boats or cars on this day. In these matters, we should set a right example for our children and youth in order to reach the churches that need our help and to give them the message that God desires them to hear, it may be necessary for us to travel on the Sabbath. But so far as possible, we should secure our tickets and make all necessary arrangements on some other day. Mm -hmm. Traveling on the Sabbath, she talks about, we should avoid it. Now this, this is also a struggle for a lot of people. Let not the precious hours uh -oh. of the Sabbath be wasted in bed. Say, wait a minute, the Sabbath is a day of rest. Mm. But does it say the Sabbath is a day of sleep? Uh -uh. No. Sabbath is a day of rest. Rest from the things of this world and spend time with God. Are we getting closer to Jesus while we're sleeping? Mm. <laughs> Make point. That's the whole purpose of the Sabbath. Mm. <laughs> you ain't coming back. We need to spend more time or we need to make sure that we um, use the Sabbath time to get closer to God. Amen? Mm, amen. Now, I, I don't like this quote. When I read this quote, you probably aren't going to like it either. You, I probably won't be allowed to speak anymore. <laughs> even though I'm an elder in the church. But I don't even like this quote. But I have to read it. The Lord said, read it. We should not provide for the Sabbath a more liberal supply 
uh, or a greater variety of food than for other days. Instead of this, the food should be more simple and less should be eaten in order that our mind may be clear and vigorous to comprehend spiritual things. Mm. Overeating befogs the brain. The most precious words may be heard and not appreciated because the mind is confused by an improper diet. By overeating on the Sabbath, many have done more than they think mm. to dishonor God. We say, I keep the Sabbath. But what are we doing at the potluck? What am I doing at the potluck? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lord help us. Okay. This one's hard because the Adventist tradition mm. is we have that nice feast, mm. that nice potluck feast on the Sabbath. Mm. We, we, we put a lot of effort and time into preparing, in, in preparing the food. But how much time are we preparing to take this message to the world out there and, mm. and to give them this gospel message. Mm. Now there's nothing wrong, of course, with having Sabbath lunch together, but we should, should, should the Sabbath meal be a feast. Mm. And a lot of that is just has to do with us as mm. individuals. It's not really the food so much. That, I mean, part of it might be that, but a lot of it is, is us. We have to have self-control. Mm. Too much. We have to say, I'm gonna eat one plate, not two. <laughs> <laughs> And so some people say, say oh, can I be one plate? And that plate is looking like, <laughs> like that. Big mountain. Mm. Now this is a big one too. What about social media on the set? Mm. Listen to this. Before the setting of the sun, let all secular work be laid aside and all secular papers be put out of sight. Mm. Now, social media is designed in a way where, you know, you, you have friends mm -hmm. and you socialize on the media, right? Mm -hmm. And they put stuff on their feed, you put stuff on your feed. Some of the stuff they put during the week, it shows up, on the, shows up every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm here trying to keep the Sabbath and you're scrolling down your feed and, and you're seeing all this worldly secular stuff. You even have advertisements on there. Yes. Spirit Brothers said we should keep all that stuff out of sight. All secular things should be put out. They didn't have social media back then. Mm -hmm. But if Ellen White was alive today, I guarantee she'd be saying, we need to get off the social media on the mm -hmm. Sabbath. You can post something, put some scripture, and then get off it. But to be thinking, I'm keeping the Sabbath, I'm sitting there, lying down, going through all the feed. Mm -hmm. That's not keeping the Sabbath. That's right. Don't deceive yourself. And we say, well, I'm just looking at the polls that are spiritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's our intention, you know. <laughs> So really, we need, and really social media is, is something we, we need to not get too much into anyway. I mean, you can use it as a tool, but it can be a big distraction and, and we can get caught up in it That's and right. lose our connection with God. That's right. So I'm wrapping up. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. We're going back to the verse we started with. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. The Bible says, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Everyone who has given their life to Christ today is now married to Christ. And God is calling us to be that pure virgin that's faithful to our husband, Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. Verse 3 says, but I fear lest that by any means... Uh, as the serpent beguiled Eve through subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Look back in your Christian walk. Have you strayed away from your faithful, strict Sabbath observance? Have you strayed away from your devotional life? Have you strayed away from the things that you used to do for the Lord? Especially since the pandemic got us out of our regular schedules and habits. Have we strayed? The Lord is calling us back. Through subtlety, the enemy has worked to, to sever our connection with the Lord. Will we commit to reform our lives, to reform our Sabbath keeping? The devil has replaced the day of the Sabbath with a counterfeit. And he's distracted our minds from the holy day 
to holidays. Mm. God is telling us to get back in line with him. Our last verse, Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 4 says, describing God's faithful people, the 144,000, these are they which were not defiled with women, the, the, the woman of Babylon, for they are virgins. They are not defiled by idolatry, by the idolatrous practices of this world. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. God is going to have a people yes. that are faithful and that keep his commandments, just yes. like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. That's right. And God wants us to be among those people. Will you strive to be among that number as, des as described in Revelation 14 by a show of hands? Yeah. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.